This episode is sponsored by the IoT Job Site, the world's only dedicated space for applying for and advertising IoT vacancies across the world. Register now for job alerts or get in touch via Let's Talk at the IoT Job Site.com. Welcome to the IoT Podcast Show and more importantly, welcome to Season 2. We are absolutely delighted that you're following us on our journey and listening to some of the fantastic guests that we've had on the show. Today I'm joined by none other than Rob Tiffany. Rob Tiffany is the Vice President of Ericsson IoT Solutions, otherwise known as Dr Digital Twin. It's been a long time waiting to get Rob on the show. He's super busy with various projects and we're going to dive into that a little bit more today and we hope you enjoy the episode. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here, Tom. Absolutely. Rob, no stranger to podcasts and clearly no stranger to IoT. Um, you know, been wanting you on the show for ages. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Absolutely fantastic. Um, really keen to kick off, really, just a bit of an introduction, if we can, just a little bit about you, your background in IoT, leading up to your current position working for Ericsson, uh, and how, yeah. you got in, how you got into this crazy world. Well, let's see. I was doing IoT back when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth, you know, <laughs> back in the 1990s. Like, after I got out of the military, my first startup I joined in the Seattle area was doing IoT. It was, you've heard of vending machines? Back way back when you think of the earliest things was um, anyway we were remotely monitoring vending machines and it was really hard in the 90s we had to create the weight radios ourselves wireless modems firmware that we had to build embedded black boxes cabling inside of dumb machines to make them smart and to talk to us um, and then stuff on a like a Windows 3.1 PC talking to not talking to a cloud, actually pulling vending machines directly over primitive wireless networks, as you can imagine back then. And so that's how I got my start, being a startup junkie initially, and then also getting into the space of, of wireless and embedded development and remote monitoring uh, to add value for customers. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. A bunch of old guys taught me, I was just a kid. Um, but you know, it took me down a path of, not only being a startup junkie for a while until I joined Microsoft, but I was um, the path of wireless, the path of embedded, the path of remote monitoring, and you know, ultimately, you know, got into the mobile space. Uh, I guess the last startup, I, last exit I did, I built a mobile, if you, you know, mobile device management company uh, in the early two thousands and sold that. Like if you think of companies like AirWatch or Mobile Iron, you know, remotely monitoring your smartphone, and then. Um, at Microsoft, after slugging it out for years with Windows Mobile and Windows Phone, I don't know if anybody remembers that with yeah, the tiles and everything. Yeah, you had yeah. that thick skin. I think we had a great product, but it was it was tough for sure. Um, but yeah, spent a bunch of time building Azure, uh, and then Windows on the Azure IoT team, and so it was great building this global IoT platform uh, in, in Azure. And, and so I was one of the co-authors of the architecture for how all that works. Um, got recruited out of there by Hitachi because uh, Hitachi is like, you know what? We need to have our own industrial IoT platform. And so I went there and I created something called Lumata. And so got to do that from scratch, which was an amazing experience starting from nothing and building an industrial IoT platform that's in the leaders quadrant in Gartner's MQ. So that was, that was a really great experience for me. Um, and so, yeah, uh, all kinds of weird stuff. I have a foundation called the Moab Foundation, like Moab, Utah, and all that, um, where I've built a an IoT digital twin platform to give away uh, to nonprofits, NGOs, because I think we can use a lot of this IoT technology to help society, not just business. And so if you think about those United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, there's a lot of use cases across, you know, whether it's water issues, poverty, climate, where IoT can play a role and make the world a better place. Um, but my day job is I'm, I'm at Ericsson, so I'm a vice president there uh, leading IoT strategy. Uh, Ericsson, we do uh, the IoT stuff we do there. Ericsson, obviously, we make cellular equ network equipment that we sell to mobile operators. You can imagine, no matter what I'm doing, it's not nearly as important as 5G. 
the 5G rollout seems that drumbeat seems to drown out anything else anyone else is doing that they might think is important. Uh, but you know how, how hype gets, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but yeah, at IoT at Ericsson, you know, we have a global connection management platform. So if you're using cellular for IoT, you know, it helps you automate getting connected. Uh, you know, there's a lot of friction, a lot of things, a lot of headwinds that slow down adoption of the Internet of Things. Part of it's connectivity and, and and software and a lot of other things. So we take care of the connectivity, uh, and then we uh, we also have a connected vehicle cloud system. Um, and you can imagine primary use case with cellular IoT is when things are outside and moving around. And so working with uh, automotive manufacturers, you know, for connected cars. And so yeah, lots of fun, St staying busy. Yeah, for sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, you know. You've been in this before it was machine to machine, right? From real primitive yeah. days of, of actually needing to do this from a vending machine point of view, saying, hey, we need we need this information. How are we going to do this, right? Yeah. Um, it's really fantastic. And one of the, one of the things I think um, is really impressive for me is the fact that you touch upon, uh, you know, IoT being used uh, for, for, for enrichment of people's lives, for the better of the world, right? Um, yeah. And, and it, could you talk a little bit more just about that? So is this part of what Moab does um, and, and, and this uh, uh, kind of free to air platform that you've developed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, like anything in life, you know, things kind of come gradually. I'm a little dense, so it takes a while for me to wake up and realize things are happening. And so over time, you know, I've been doing IoT for so long for commercial reasons, for business. Um, but I found myself on panel discussions and doing events where they're saying, well, could you talk about how we might use IoT for water issues or poverty? And so I would scramble and study up on, and then over time, I think a light bulb came on for me. I was like, wow, I mean, what is IoT? It's remotely knowing the state of something without you being there. It's measuring things, right? It's knowing something, having that information come back to you so you can take an action. And, um, so I started looking at, you know, if I look and then the sustainable development goals made it real easy to kind of categorize things for you um, so that you're not just shooting everywhere in the dark. And so it's like when you find out both poverty and hunger, which are like SDG one and two, well, they're directly tied to agriculture, as it turns out. Most people who are in deep poverty actually work in the agriculture space. And so when you you can parlay that into going, OK. Well, how, how can IoT help agriculture? And I know a lot of us talk about precision agriculture and IoT to increase crop yields and things mm -hmm. like that. And so what I, with Mo, since I actually designed and I still write code um, and build stuff, you know, um, I started building this lightweight IoT platform that's portable, can run on a tiny device instead of having to run in the cloud. Um, when you're trying to help people who are nonprofits or NGOs, they don't have a lot of cash yeah and you know and so you can't just show up and say yes we have this giant cloud iot platform and we're going to charge you all this money and it's going to be great it's yeah. like you need to you need to give it away for free if you can and so it's a lightweight uh, obviously i spent a lot of time i kind of got really heavy into digital twins back at hitachi when we we're building lumato they, we call them asset avatars and um and so I know a lot about that. And so the platform has digital twin capabilities built right into it. Um, and so the thinking with the Moab Foundation, it's like a few things. S step one is just awareness. Um, what are the, the 17 sustainable development goals? What are the use cases? And this is the hard part. What are all the use cases where it makes sense to use IoT? Because you shouldn't always try to pound a square peg in a round hole if it doesn't make sense. And so laying those out, laying out, Recipes, what are the use cases where IoT can make a difference? Um, what's the game plan? What's, how, 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 do you, what, how do you exploit that? How do you, what's the actionable plan uh, to take care of that? Uh, and then to give the people, it's, gonna, it's still volunteers. It's probably like the Peace Corps or anything else, right? <laughs> it's like, here's this free technology. Here is the recipe. Here's the plan to take action on whatever this particular use case is, if it's on climate or something. Um, and then, but ultimately it still comes down to people. And so, uh, and so, yeah, you're, you're trying to keep costs as low as possible. Uh, and you do fundraising and things like that. And so it's kind of something I'm, it's on the side, obviously I have my day job and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, but I've got a lot of, a lot of friends, 
probably people you know, you know, a lot of people from the IoT space and analysts and stuff like that who I've known for years, uh, who are on my advisory board. And so, uh, yeah, we're we're we're, we're kind of trying to get that thing taken off. So yeah, it's kind of exciting stuff, and you really can move the needle with really simple things. You know, a lot of people in IoT spend too much time talking about things like AI and. Yeah, blockchain yeah. and all kinds of stuff they don't even know what they're talking about and customers have no idea what they're talking <laughs> about either it turns out there's tremendous value to be had with just the basics of the, of the internet of things and so and then when it comes to making an impact in people's lives around the world you find that just the smallest things can move the needle for them in dramatic ways yeah um so that's kind of where my head's at you know um yeah so yeah Oh, it's, it's amazing. I think from, a, you know, the fact that you say it runs on a device as opposed to being in the cloud is really special because from a developing world point of view, yeah. countries that are developing that don't have, you know, they don't apps, have all that. Yeah, they don't have all of that. Right. We had uh, we had Omar uh, Casey on from uh, OQ Tech that's doing a, a, a hybrid cellular uh, Internet connectivity. We were talking around. Uh, you know, most of the world doesn't have access to, to good quality broadband, right? And we completely right. forget that, you know, yeah. everyone's harping on yes. about 5G. Some people can't even get online. So I think that's... You're right. I think that's so good that, you know, that you're doing this in conjunction, giving something back. And, and that's really kind of something I'm really passionate about with IoT in general is the fact that, you know, and I've said it so many times before on previous episodes and in conversation that I've come from this pay TV uh, world and at the end of the day, it's just entertainment. So what you're doing with IoT and, and, and the differences it can make are tremendous. And that's something really to be proud about in my in my view. So, you know, good on you with that, Rob. It's, Thank uh, you. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Most places, they don't have, you can't talk about bandwidth. You're, they don't even have electricity Yeah. in some places, right? Yeah. So you need to make sure you have an IoT platform that's lightweight, it's low power. You can power it with batteries and solar. Um, you may have to create your own network. You know, you have to be much more resourceful. Um, but when you're, you know, how it is in life, especially when you know being in technology, the greatest innovations usually come when you have heavy constraints put upon you, and 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 that things are tough. Uh, it makes you have to think more. Uh, then when things are good and easy and abundant, then you're like, ah, whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know this from a coding perspective, right? You know, some of the best yeah. coders have used, uh, be, be, you know, primitive computers, right? Where you've yes. got to re refactor chunks of C and you've got to make sure you're using clean code principles, etc. And it's making the most out of what Absolutely. you have, right? Limited yes. RAM, limited functionality. Uh, That's the, the yeah. lessons I learned back in the 90s doing IoT everything was much smaller. Yeah. Um, I think learning from the guys who I learned from who were RF engineers, we were doing the tiniest embedded development. I mean, think about the state of technology in the 90s and programming and things like that. It was pretty tough. Uh, how you communicated your bit encoded packets that you were creating because we had to pay by the byte. You know, yeah, wireless yeah. data was horribly expensive back then. And so when you start your journey in IoT from a place where you had to invent everything from scratch, every aspect of the of a solution, right? Then when you fast forward to today, it's seemingly easy to do IoT. And so it, I think it kind of gives you kind of a, a calmness. I don't know how to explain it, where it's like, I've already done the hardest possible scenario of IoT. Whatever we're doing today is a piece of cake. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Well, it's Comparatively. A yeah, the luxury of bandwidth, right? You know, we're, yeah. we're doing stuff, you know, not only a resource constrained device, but pay yeah. per byte, as you say, right? So it's yeah. got to work, it's got to be lightweight, it's got to, it's got to, and it's got to be super functional. Um, right. So, so every, everything works, uh, you know, yeah. seamlessly after that, right? So. I mean, you do, you do embedded development, the stuff yeah. that we call embedded development today, compare that to what embedded development burning EPROMs back in the 90s was like. It's like night and day. You know, you know, some of these little devices, they have the power of a Pentium chip, I know, I you know, know. <laughs> it's, crazy. it's crazy. Yeah. You know, what, what was it? Something like 100 and, 150 years to get to a gigahertz and then like two months to double it or something like that. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's absolutely yeah. unbelievable. 
absolutely uh, rob i want to i want to talk to you a little bit more about digital twins if i may yeah um, yeah so so you're known as dr digital twin you know <laughs> I, all, all the stuff that you did uh back at itachi right and 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 very well respected and thought of as you say you know you're part of the the gartner uh the it's the quadrant is it, is it gartner oh quadrant? yeah yeah oh well yeah lumada is a leader in magic quadrant for industrial it but then you're right all those other like analyticas and stuff like that you know, th thought leadership around digital twins and industry 4 all that stuff. So super basic for people that haven't worked in digital twin. Uh, what is digital twin? Why is it important? And, and where is it going? Yeah, I'm a big believer of digital twins should actually live at the heart of every IoT platform. Um, a lot of people think it's about augmented reality or VR or something like that. And that's just a, a view of a digital twin, actually. If you get right down to it, digital twin is a data structure. Um, you're, you know, you, everyone hears the same definition. It's, you know, it's a digital version of a physical object, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it could be a digital equivalent of a machine or a subsystem or a process or a whole factory and all that kind of stuff. And so- um, Asset avatars, right? Asset avatars, yes. Giant seven foot blue aliens, <laughs> you know? And so, <laughs> But, you know, assets, uh, you know, with the, you know, there's only, you know, if you're working for a giant manufacturer like Hitachi, they typically think of everything as an asset. And mm -hmm. so that kind of is how the, the, the mindset. And um, actually in Asia, the idea, the term avatar actually made a lot more sense to people when they think about this concept than twin, believe it or not. Um, and so uh, the avatar of a machine, for instance, you know, there's a machine, it's got its static properties that don't change much, how, how big is it, all, all these attributes about it. It's got dynamic things like you're getting sensor values from, you know, temperature, heat, vibration, RPM on a motor, all kinds of things like that, you know. Um, I overuse when I describe digital twins, I probably do this too often, but I always just explain it like a, as a car because it's, it's important to talk about things that everyone understands. And so when you're driving your car, you've got a, an engine, you've got a transmission, you've got four tires, you know, tires have tire pressure. And so there's that the basics of knowing about the state of your car. And for the longest time in IoT, data is just coming back and showing up in rows and columns and databases, which is fine. But when you model that same thing as a digital twin, I think it's it's people can wrap their heads around it more easily. They can visualize it better, even if it's not a visual representation. And so you describe those four tires, you say, yes, it's got tire pressure and the pressure is measured in PSI, pounds per square inch. And what's, and then there's the actual value. IOT is the plumbing mm -hmm. sending you the, the actual data, but you've created a data model. Some, if you think if you're a database person, you've built data structures and things like that. Think of the digital twin ultimately initially is just that data structure that's saying, here's what it looks like. Here are the dynamic things about it. And the and here and then what's great about digital twins and not a lot of people do this usually the the twin is just kind of that static view, mm -hmm. and then they can, they put analytics over here and you point analytics at the twin but which is fine, but you can also layer in KPIs and other things into the twin itself. So if I have the twin of the car, and then it's got properties for the four tires and tire pressure, just simple pattern matching, the I. I as a customer, I expect my tires to be pressurized to 32 pounds per square inch, let's say. Uh, and the data type is integer. <laughs> and But I can also, you know, you, you talk about what you expect, you know, and so when you just do simple things like KPIs, red, yellow, you know, green, you know, when you're in this range. And so you can set KPIs and attach that to the twin. It's all a combination of IoT sending data. It's twins defining what the model looks like and then it's software it's software bots agents whatever you want to call them and they're looking at the real data they're looking at what the twins telling you it expects it to be and then it makes a decision based on that and so you know you hear lots of people love to talk about predictive analytics or going the next step and doing prescriptive what once i find this out what do i do about it what's the what what do i what, how do i take care of this problem afterwards you can layer that stuff into a twin as well, um, which I know sounds crazy. Think about a twin. I, you know, if it's if you're thinking about it like a car, think about that owner's manual that's in the glove compartment. 
That's the digital twin of the car. We're just making that digital. Think about it like your doctor, your physician. Yeah. You're the patient. You're showing up the doctor. What's the doctor doing? Well, it knows about a human. They went to medical school and they know everything about and they they're trying to figure out, well, you've got all these symptoms and they're trying to figure out, well, I think this means that you have this ailment. And then I based on my knowledge or reference I look up, I'm here's the prescription I'm going to give to you or I'm going to have you go do this procedure. It's the same thing if you think about it in terms that people can understand. Yeah. And so that's what, you know, software, IoT, and digital twins all working together can bring a lot of this stuff to life. Um, I find, and again, you know, digital twins are the Wild West. Just like IoT has been the Wild West. You know, people say, where's the standards, you know? Yeah. Um, and so a, a lot of times it's the standards are made by the people who win, you know, yeah. typically. Not by, not by standards bodies or consortiums. Usually it works the other way around. I, I, I apologize to all you consortium people but you're always usually in last place. Yeah. It's just true. It's just true. You know, big companies are the pioneers of people who make it happen and then some something sticks. That's the de facto standard, right? Mm. And so uh, I have taken many liberties in pushing the envelope of what a digital qu twin can do over time. And, uh, and some people like it. The, you know, in the end, are you driving value for the customer, right? You know, are they, they've got all their use cases in mind they're trying to save money, make money, safety. There's probably a million IoT use cases, and so you're really just trying to you're really just trying to do that in the easiest way possible. Um, yeah. I, I, I thank you. I think it's a it's an amazing overview for people that d d didn't particularly understand digital twin, and I think the analogy of the car replicating it is 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 fantastic. And as you say, there's a, there's a million types of use cases, and yeah, and all almost limitless amount of. Uh, replications that can be made in advance and some digital twin, right? Right. Um, and, and it's interesting you should say, and, and, and it's almost logical, isn't it, that the, that the enterprise business is going to set the de facto standard because they've braced the market, they've created it, it's worked, and therefore you have a benchmark, right? Yes. Um, and, and theory yes. and practice are obviously two separate things. So in practice, it's worked and it's happened and you, and you can theorize about something you can talk about it yeah but unless it's actually running in 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 process then then you never really know and and that's clearly that what you had done in the past and 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 you know and and, and very successful you've probably talked to dozens of people in, here or just in daily life around yeah. it saying a lot well we're <laughs> they're like well we're waiting for all the standards to yeah, be here yeah, yeah. and then we will start doing iot well if that's your mindset you're going to miss the whole thing hmm. Um, as it turns out, IoT is made up of lots of standards that are already standards. They're official standards. Uh, the problem is there's too many of them, uh, especially in an industrial world where you're dealing with all kinds of weird industrial protocols and data formats. It makes things more complicated. And so the reality is you need to understand the high level. What am I doing? What's IoT? I have a physical object here and it can talk to me. You know, I'm competing with a guy with a clipboard. You know, I used to walk somewhere, drive somewhere, fly on a plane to go visit something, a machine, look at a gauge, uh, analog gauge or something, and write it down on a clipboard, go back to the office and type it into some computer system to the system of record. That's what you're competing with with IoT. We did it with, we're competing with paper and pencil as, you know, you talk about things like digital transformation as a company becomes more mature. They went from paper and pencil to maybe now the person's got a tablet or a smartphone or something like that. And they're entering it in. And with the magic of wireless, the data goes straight from the remote location into the system record. Now with IoT, the machine just talks to us and it sends the data strictly back to the, da the system record. That's really all it is. You know, it's important to just remember how simple this stuff is and not make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so if twins help you, that's great. But, you know. You, you got to go with what works for you, for sure. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think that that's what it is, right? You know, brass tacks, you know, we're, we're essentially making it easier. We're, we're, um, and, you know, and reducing that manual input of someone going to have to check that gauge, right? You know, many, many examples that we've had here on the show and people that I talk to, you know, we talk about uh, our, our agri-tech and farming and the fact that yeah. you know, you're herding cattle and, you know, you go to Australia, right? And some of the some of the farms in Australia are humongous, right? Yeah. And, 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 and yeah. Midwestern America. 
Uh, and and that's that's a direct benefit of, of having this information, of having these sensors, of being able to pick up this information. Um, Absolutely. And and, 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 the t and the twin variant of that, and being able to do that from a from a physical perspective and run out various iterations, and you know, is 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 absolutely fantastic. Um, what I mean, what in, in terms of the future, right? So I, I'm so so curious. Yes, I speak to loads of people in IoT, right? But but you know, you've lived and breathed this for many many years, and also have worked on many successful things. I'm curious to know what you think it looks like in the future, not just from a digital twin perspective, but also, you know, people talk about everything being connected and you know, fourth industrial revolution and, you know, um, Klaus Schwab and, you know, various things. But, you know, we're not quite there yet. Right. And, no. uh, you know, and why is that? And, and so, so I've asked you two questions there. Yes. But, you know, why aren't we there and where are we going? OK, luckily, I have the definitive answers <laughs> to these questions. Good. Thank you. Thank you for, well, I'm glad I'm recording it. Yes, good thing. <laughs> good. Yes, I see the record lights on. I can't tell you how many videos i've been on where they go oh, i forgot to record um <laughs> you know what a whole lot of companies analyst firms including the company i work for thought we'd be at like 50 billion connected iot devices by 2020 and we're barely at a fraction of that iot has underperformed it hasn't made it to where we all thought it would be we, um i think you know you had the smartphone revolution and apps and that was just like a rocket ship and it was really obvious and it just worked and it was a huge success. A lot of people thought IoT was gonna be the same way, uh, but it hasn't been. And so when you talk about how's it gonna be in the future, unless something changes dramatically, it's not gonna be the bright future you think it's gonna be because the, the past and the present are telling us that. Um, and so as someone who's at a front row seat watching this mega trend, you can observe well, what's working well and what's not and how do we fix it? And so one of the things I've noticed is um, IoT is still a very manual process. And I'm just thinking about, you know, when customers wanna do IoT for whatever the use case, whatever value they're trying to derive, they say, I wanna do an IoT project and I'm gonna use a platform and I'm gonna do analytics. More times than not, they hire a consulting firm or a system integrator or something like that, all these global SIs. IoT is a consulting project. It's a consulting gig a lot of times. Even though platform players want to tell you you can do it yourself. It just depends on your sophistication. What the problem is, is that you've probably seen the same numbers I have. 75, 80% of IoT projects are failing at the proof of concept phase. They're never making it to production. Customers are getting fed up and they're they have the value they're looking for. They hire the consulting firm. They like, where's the outcome? The, mm. the app, the analytics that's going to give me this value that's that I'm looking for. Instead, what's happening is consultants are spending months or years programming devices and configuring devices and configuring platforms and things like that that are what I characterize as just low value activity. They are things you have to do in order to get to the good stuff. If you are going to use some advanced analytics to derive some outcome. You can't do that until you have data coming from machines, right? And all that other stuff. So there's a lot of, <clears throat> think about it. You know, you've done embedded development. There's, there's, there's hardware, hardware's hard. <laughs> uh, embedded developers, short range networking, edge gateway, edge compute stuff, long range networking, cloud on-prem platforms, analytics. There's so many different um, pillars or components to make up an IoT solution with a lot of uh, different skill sets and domain knowledge that you have to have in order to do that. It's hard to find one person or anything that knows how to do all that stuff. And so, and you, and it, this is not new information. Complexity is one of the big headwinds to IoT success. It's just really complex. And so that slows things down dramatically. Um, another big headwind is security. Um, Turns out we accidentally created the largest attack surface in the history of computing by doing IoT. Oops, sorry, um, it, but it's true. That's what we yeah. did. You, and, and if you look at things like the Mirai botnet a few years ago, and mm -hmm. you're, you're all watching the news every week now, the hack attacks are getting worse and worse. And IoT is a big vulnerability. And so if you're a decision maker, if you're a chief information officer or CTO at a company and you're going, I really want to do IoT because I see the value it's going to provide my company, 
but I'm really worried that I'm going to get hacked to death and the risk reward part starts to worry me some. And maybe it's not worth doing because of the hackers and stuff like that. So then the, the answer to the question is, okay, let's fix it. So I am actually, I still write code. I still design things. I'm working, I don't want to call it a secret skunk work project because it's not totally secret, but I am working on a separate project right now around the clock uh, at Ericsson. Uh, the project's code name is Thunderstruck, like the ACDC song. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And, and I'm actually single-handedly trying to rescue the entire IoT ecosystem from failure. And so I'm working on a system where like when you're doing IOP project on the device side, <clears throat> you're typically as a developer, you're writing code to an SDK, a software development kit that's been provided to you by Azure IoT Hub or AWS or ThingWorks or PTC, you know, whoever, yeah. right? Um, and when you write code to that SDK, you're permanently connected to that platform for the life of that device, which could be a real problem if it's an industrial device that's expected to be going for decades in a factory. Um, I've got, I'm creating something new with a platform. It's a globally scalable cloud system. Um, it uses something I call a universal device SDK. Uh, imagine a scenario where a semiconductor OEM, <clears throat> device OEM, even consultants, if they could use the same SDK and it's identical and it's really simple across every device they make, knowing that they have a promise that says, if you use this single SDK, I'll connect you to any IoT platform or any analytics platform or storage, if that's what you want, then they'll be less hesitant because we're only going to get to these big numbers if manufacturers of things, machines, are pre-baking in compute, storage, networking at time of manufacturing. Because right now, we are all living in an aftermarket car stereo store with IoT. We are just getting bare naked devices and we are having to put software on them and connect to uh, sensors and pull that data together and security and sending that data so it's a lot of, that's why we're doing all this coding right mm. so i want to try to blow that away i want machines at time of manufacturing having you know you call my system i'll give you millions of unique identities and security tokens and a url and so you're a manufacturer in shenzhen and you build these machines and then a customer in france buys it they turn it on the first time in Paris, it wakes up, it connects, the software calls the URL I give it, reaches out and says, hey, here I am. Oh, I go, yeah, oh, I see you were made by this company in China and you were bought by this company in France and I see they're using ThingWorks. I'm gonna automatically automate connecting you to ThingWorks and registering your million devices and I'm gonna start flowing the telemetry automatically. And so automating the server side, because luckily, all these IoT platforms, analytics platforms, they all have REST APIs, so I can automate that. So anyway, automate the server, the cloud side, streamline the device side, and then along the way, I can break cloud lock-in. You probably hear lots of people about worrying about cloud lock-in or platform lock-in or having a multi-cloud strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other aspect I'm trying to do is help those folks as well. If I can automate connecting you to a particular backend system, I can disconnect you and move you to another one with a mouse click. So I wanna make that easy. And then last but not least, security. Um, if I've got all these data streams from every device flowing through my system, I can apply security policies to every individual data stream um, to, to lock that down. Because you know, in, instead of your customer's critical infrastructure getting attacked by a denial of service attack, if you've got some system way out on the internet somewhere on the network far away and we're raising the shields for you and detecting devices attacking and then having rules that can lock those devices down long before it hits your platform, that's a good thing. So anyway, I know I'm just rambling here, but I'm, I'm trying to fix what I think are the problems in the space. And so we'll see what happens. Yeah. No, absolutely not rambling at all. <laughs> Rob, it's great. I think, I think I think, the main thing that you're talking about there is the fact that, you know, we're looking at 
principles of universal connection, right? And and, yeah. and, and, and and are you trying to say that essentially the reasons for the scale and what we've not seen yet we've spoken about in various reports over the years is everyone is trying to do something in their own way. The analogy you're using at this, um, you know, this, this car radio shop, this after sale type approach where yeah. you're having a bolt on software, etc. But the, the idea and the premise is that we, we have this almost like this kind of single sign on mentality whereby we know what's happening we know where you're connecting we know what's going through and that will rapidly increase the amount of use cases and 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 deployments that are out there is that right that's right you know you know we live in a capitalist society everybody's playing a winner take all game yeah all, and that's all an issue giant... though isn't it really in general it's it's fine with me because that's how every trend works. I don't want to. I don't want. I, I can't. I can't tell all these big companies what to do, mm. but I can see when everyone wants to win at the exclusion of their other competitors, and they're saying it's my way or the highway. You got to build it my way. All of a sudden, you've got a lot of manual processes all connecting to individual, you know, fragmented systems. And so all I'm trying to do, I hate to use the word democratize. But I'm just like, what if I gave you one way to do the same thing over and over again, but give you the flexibility to connect to whoever you want to connect to? Mm. Um, obviously, these big platform players, cloud players, they wouldn't. It's not in their best interest to provide that kind of capability because it makes it easy for the customer to leave them, yeah. right? Yeah. They want to win. They want to yeah. win. And so, if you have some impartial third party who's not in it for the same reasons. Um, that's really just super has that empathy for the customer uh, and knows that th what I'm trying to accomplish is I need to get you to value 10 X faster because these projects are taking too long projects are being canceled. And so that's all you do is I sit back and observe. It's really manual process projects are failing. They're taking too long, too much money is being spent in billable hours to consultants. How can I streamline or shorten that dramatically? So you know, the customers getting the value and seeing yeah. that and getting excited about it because that's how, because in the end, this, what I'm working on, I want to lift all boats. I'm really here just trying to help the entire ecosystem, not just one player in this case. That's, that's the takeaway. Yeah. And, 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 and that's primarily what we look at with IoT. We started to talk by saying the almost limitless about the use cases that are available to enrich and to better people's lives. Um, you know, there's an altruistic sense of, uh, the, you know, maybe the winner shouldn't take all, right? You know, maybe there, maybe there should be some standards at some point. Maybe there should be a charter of how we're doing this because at the end of the day, we're trying to help those that need it through some of these solutions, ultimately, right? Yeah. I mean, being clearly, yeah. it's, it's not just about that, but there's so many other benefits involved that, you know, uh, me coming from an open, open source background, you know. Yeah, yes. It, you know, this is this is the way that I'm crying. Like, why, you know, why aren't these things kind of peer reviewed and people are all working together on it? And and that, absolutely. And that may be what. And and as you say, one of the primary reasons why we are behind, right? Yeah, people don't realize it. They hear about the the, the use cases and the value, and they're excited about it. But what they don't realize is there's a bunch of gladiators in an arena battling it out right now, trying to win. Yeah. And they really don't care about the whole ecosystem winning. Yeah. They want to win. And you're right about open source and that mentality. That's exactly where my head's at too. I don't know if people realize you can build all this IoT technology 100% with open source technology. Every last aspect of an IoT system can be built with, there's so much stuff out there today. That's why IoT started taking off, you know, 10 years ago. You had that perfect storm, connect almost ubiquitous connectivity around the world lowering cost of microcontrollers and things like that and sensors all of a sudden storage especially in cloud storage started going towards zero um and then analytics you know because you know i always say you know it's connect collect analyze act you've got to analyze that data to drive insights from all that information right well, it used to be only governments or wealthy companies could afford expensive analytics tools. But guess what? Anybody can go to Apache.org now and yeah. download their favorite open source analytics and drive. You obviously have to know how to use it, but derive value that way and yeah. derive outcomes. And so, uh, you know what? The value, it's right there for the taking. And, and 
that open source mentality is a great way to think about it. Um, but there's this other battle going on over here that's slowing things down. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I get it. I, I, and I guess my final question to you, Rob, today, and, and it, this is great, you know, it's such, such good, such good uh, conversation. You know, is the future bright then for IoT? If we can get yeah. past these issues, is it bright? Is it buoyant? Are we going to get to where we've spoken about over the years? Yes, we are. But we're going to have to be very mindful about security. We'll break through all these barriers that we're talking about now so that we get to that value. But we're going <clears> to, <throat> there's bad actors all around the world um, who, who don't have our best interests in mind. And so we will be successful, but everybody who's involved in IoT projects and the space, they need to just take on that security first mindset. Um, and if they do that and they follow a really short list of some basic simple rules usually you'll be in good shape and so i think you know it's just like us doing this podcast right now step one is just awareness of what's going on and what's the problem as soon as people click into realizing that and that, then then they can start making the right decisions because we can't we're not going to blindly go into the future and succeed mm. we're going to have to go into the future with our eyes wide open uh, to things. And when we do that, though, I think we're going to be in good shape and it's going to be an exciting, bright future for all of us. Fantastic. Rob, honestly, I'm so pleased that, uh, you know, you've come onto the show and that you've, you've had that, uh, you know, you've had this time to talk to me. It's, it's fantastic. And, and leaving it on the note of security is, is a personal favorite for mine. You know, I talk about secure by design principles all the time by people. Yeah. This isn't a gold plating exercise. Let's, let's think about it to start with. Um, and it, your insights are, are truly fantastic. So we really, really appreciate it, Rob. And uh, thank you so much once again. Thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you. Please get involved in the episode as usual, guys. Like, comment, share. Use the hashtag the IoT podcast. Really want to promote the podcast and the stories, especially some of the fantastic guests like we've had Rob on today out there to people who may not have heard of the show yet. We look forward to joining you on the next episode.